for coming along this evening. Um, I'm not quite sure I can offer you the, the wow factor of the Platinum Jubilee or Paddington Bear meets, meets the Queen, but hopefully you're going to enjoy my talk this evening. Um, at the beginning of the First World War, Germany possessed a unique weapon, the likes of which had never before been deployed in war, Zeppelin airships. A retired army officer, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, had launched his first airship in July 1900. Initially, the authorities did not take him too seriously, but his determination to continue after a number of potentially crushing failures won him the admiration of the German people. And that public attention eventually brought him the much needed funding necessary to continue his work. By the time he launched his third airship in October 1906, the German military had begun to take notice. Through triumph and tragedy, as his airships strive to meet the ever increasing demands for speed, altitude and lifting capacity, the German people continued to support Count Zeppelin's efforts. For the population of Germany, his airships became an iconic source of national pride and the very embodiment of German technical superiority. The rapid progress made by Count Zeppelin's airships was well known in Britain too, and raised concerns. Britain had nothing to compare with Germany's giant rigid airships. The Royal Navy attempted to build a Zeppelin type airship of its own to evaluate the potential threat, but it ended in disaster when rigid naval airship number one broke its back in a powerful gust of wind before it ever flew. Britain was left to wonder and fear the worst from the potential threat offered by Germany's fleet of Zeppelins. For centuries, the British had slept soundly in their beds, safe in the knowledge that the Royal Navy patrolled the seas around these islands and protected them from invasion. Yet from the moment in 1903, when the Wright brothers' flimsy aeroplane took hesitatingly to the air for 12 seconds, everything changed. From that starting point, aviation developed rapidly, although it was a little slower to get moving in Britain. In fact, another five years passed before the first successful flight took place in this country, lasting all of 27 seconds. Yet just a year later, in 1909, the French aviation pioneer Louis Blériot flew across the English Channel. The words uttered by a newspaper baron in 1906 now rung true. Britain was no longer an island. At the outbreak of the First World War, Britain had two air forces, the Army's Royal Flying Corps and the Navy's Royal Naval Air Service. Not until April 1918 did they amalgamate to form the Royal Air Force. Within days of the declaration of war in August 1914, the Royal Flying Corps departed for France as part of the British Expeditionary Force. Meanwhile, the RNAS began patrolling the east coast of Britain on the lookout for enemy aircraft, airships and submarines, but none came. Three weeks into the war, on the 25th of August, the Admiralty ordered their East Church Squadron, the most effective at that time, to Belgium in support of a Royal Marine Brigade. But the rapid German advance led to their recall just five days later. The squadron commander, Charles Sampson, however, was not keen to return to the monotony of coastal patrol and did all he could to delay their return to England. A week after the recall order, and with Samson still finding excuses to remain at Dunkirk, Winston Churchill saw an opportunity and grabbed it with both hands. Churchill was at the time the First Lord of the Admiralty, the political head 
of the Royal Navy. He had long shown an interest in the development of aviation and had done much to encourage naval enterprise in the air. Now, as bullish as ever, he saw a chance to deal the Zeppelin threat a blow by taking the war to them and attacking the Zeppelins at their home bases in Germany. Here, in essence, we have the origins of strategic bombing at a time when there were no specialized bomber aircraft. Squadron Commander Sampson's delaying tactics had paid dividends. Now, the Admiralty sent Sampson's men Zeppelin hunting. The squadron approached their task with enthusiasm and were given the Zeppelin sheds at Cologne and Dusseldorf as their targets. Setting up their base at Antwerp, arrangements for the attack were made by Major Eugene Gerard. An attempt was made on the 22nd of September with four aircraft piloted by Major Gerard, Lieutenant Commander Spencer Gray, Lieutenant Reginald Marix, and Lieutenant Charles Collard. But encountering thick fog on the way, three of the pilots turned back. However, Lieutenant Collett flew on. And when he thought he must be close to the target, Dusseldorf, he descended through the murk, finding clear air at 400 feet and amazingly in sight of Dusseldorf's Goldsheim shed. His three bombs all just missed the target, two of them failing to explode but it had been a valiant effort. The squadron planned to strike against the twin targets again as they awaited additional aircraft to join them, but dramatic events meant their time was running out. The initial advance of the German army in August 1914 had swept past Antwerp, but now on the 28th of September, an attack on the city commenced as heavy artillery began to systematically destroy its outer ring of forts. By the 1st of October, German forces were only about six miles from the RNAS airfield, and the Belgian army was preparing to abandon the city. On the 6th of October, when the German artillery opened fire on the inner circle of forts, the Belgian field army received orders to evacuate Antwerp. The RNAS pilots were instructed to leave the city at dawn on the 7th of October, although Samson left two aeroplanes to remain as long as possible in case an opportunity arose to launch one final attack on the Zeppelin sheds. The two pilots who stayed behind were Lieutenant Commander Spencer Gray and Lieutenant Reginald Marix, with a small ground crew and Lieutenant Sidney Sippy who was help, hoping to repair his damaged aeroplane and fly it out. That morning, an official announcement informed the citizens of Antwerp that a German bombardment was imminent and advised those who wished to leave to do, leave to do so without delay. That news, combined with the sight of the army marching away, broke the spirit of the inhabitants of Antwerp. A mass of humanity evacuated that city, frantically crowding onto boats of all shapes and sizes, others streaming westwards out of the city on foot, more headed north towards the neutral Netherlands. Throughout the 7th of October, the German artillery advanced closer to the city, preparing to open their bombardment at midnight as advised to the city authorities. Poor weather kept grey, and Marix grounded. The German barrage on the inner forts recommenced at about 11.30 p.m., then on the city a few minutes after midnight. Continuing through the night, it prompted a second mass evacuation. For the time being, the RNAS airfield at Willerick, a short distance behind the inner fort line, escaped attack as shells screamed over on their way to the city. Fierce fighting continued along the inner fort line on the 8th of October, and although Gray and Marix were desperate to commence the raid, the mist that greeted them in the morning conspired against them. At 1pm, the poor conditions persisted, but Gray, with time running out, recognised that it was now or never and gave the order to launch the raid. 30 minutes later, 
both pilots were on their way. Spencer Gray heading for Cologne in Sopwith tabloid number 167 and Reginald Marix heading for Dusseldorf in tabloid number 168, each carrying just two 20 pound bombs. Gray found his way to Cologne without any problems, but as he closed on the city, he found it engulfed in a thick mist. To add to his difficulties, he was unsure of the exact location of the Zeppelin shed. Gray had been given two possible positions, one to the northwest of the city and one to the south. It was in fact at Bickendorf to the northwest. Gray descended through the mist to 600 feet and began to look for the shed, despite attracting a heavy fire. After some 10 minutes of fruitless searching, he gave up and decided instead to attack the main railway station in the middle of the town where he saw a number of trains drawn up. The station, lying alongside Cologne's magnificent cathedral, presented a huge target. Gray released his two bombs and turned back to Antwerp. Damage to the station, however, appears to have been negligible. After an uneventful return flight, Lieutenant Commander Gray landed safely back at Antwerp at 4.45 p.m. There was no sign of Marix. Reggie Marix had clambered into his tabloid just before 1.30 p.m. Having removed his uniform cap, which he suspended around his neck on a length of string so it hung down his back, he reasoned he may need it if forced down and taken prisoner. A final instrument check and he was off. Marix headed west at first, then circled back to the north of the city, avoiding the German concentrations to the south before setting course eastwards to Germany and his target, Dusseldorf. In Dusseldorf, little had happened to improve the defences in the 16 days since Collett's previous attack. However, work on a new shed at Lohausen was complete, and on the 3rd of October, Zeppelin Z9 had transferred there from Goldsheim, a distance of about two and a half miles. Marix was flying at about 3,000 feet as he approached Dusseldorf from the southwest. The journey so far free of incident. However, his approach had not gone unnoticed and the news quickly passed to the Zeppelin sheds north of the city. Marix continued over the old city, descending slowly before turning north. Now, however, Marix had a problem. He scanned the ground but could not locate the Zeppelin shed. In his account of the raid, he wrote, uh, the shed was not where I expected to find it, and my map had been wrongly marked, so I had to fly around for a bit, which excited some interest. This interest came from an anti-aircraft gun positioned at a munitions factory in Derendorf. The gun fired three rounds, then, much to Marix's relief, it jammed. Marix was looking for the Goldsheim shed, the one Collett attacked in September. He was unaware of the new shed at Lohausen. When he did eventually discover it, he pre presumed it was Goldstein, explaining that he uh, found the shed further away from the town than I had expected. In fact, as Marek spotted the new shed, he was actually flying over Goldstein without realising and came under fire from guards there. A moments later, bullets fired from an army rifle range also whizzed past. Marix, however, remained focused on the Zeppelin shed. He had one last decision to make. As soon as I was sure of my target, I put my nose down and dived with my engine still on. Oh, I would not normally do this as it was an awful strain on the engine as the revs go up. Well, I'd usually switched off to come down, but then it took a, a certain amount of time for the engine to pick up again. I wanted no loitering near the ground. The engine stood up well, and when I was about 600 feet, I released the two bombs, one after the other, and began to pull out of the dive. Although focused on the target, Marix recalled the machine guns defending the shed opening fire with rapid points of flame. His first bomb exploded 
just short of the shed, gouging a crater in the earth. But the second bomb completely justified the trials of the month-long operation. Marix scored a direct hit. As he pulled his straining aircraft out of the dive, he glanced over his shoulder and was rewarded with the sight of an enormous sheet of flame pouring out of the shed. It was, he reported, a magnificent sight. His second bomb had exploded inside the shed, hot shrapnel ripping into the dormant Zeppelin. Within seconds, the hydrogen inside the Zeppelin's gas cells was burning intensely, sending flames shooting up 500 feet through the roof and forming a great pall of thick black smoke over the shed. The tremendous heat generated inside the shed caused the Zeppelin's loaded bomb racks to melt, dropping their potentially lethal cargo to the ground. But fortunately, they were not fused. As Marix disappeared into the distance, Zeppelin Z9 crumpled under its own weight, a burning tangled wreck of red hot metal. Four people were dead and 10 others injured. But Marix did not escape, uh, escape unscathed. Having begun to climb away from the burning shed, he tried to turn, but the rudder did not respond. And with horror, he found himself heading deeper into Germany. Bullets had jammed his rudder. Fortunately, the Sopwith tabloid used wing warping instead of ailerons for lateral control, and Marix discovered that by careful manipulation, he could slowly turn his aircraft and gradually brought it around until he was back on course for Antwerp. But this was only the start of the problems that marked Marix's remarkable journey back to safety. As the light began to fade, Marix was back within 20 miles of Antwerp, but he realized that crosswinds had forced him north. Concerns over his fuel supply raised the spectre of an emergency landing in the dark with no rudder control if he tried to reach the airfield. Rather than take that risk, he landed his tabloid in a large field. While Marix pondered his next move, a, a group of a Belgian gendarmes arrived and confirmed he was north of Antwerp. Having explained he needed to get back to the city, the gendarmes told him that a railway engine was leaving shortly from a station close by, hoping to get into Antwerp to bring out a trainload of refugees. They arranged for Marix to ride on the engine. While he waited, he inspected his aircraft. The enemy fire encountered over Dusseldorf had been more accurate than he had realised. He counted 30 bullet holes in the fuselage and wings, and one through the peak of his cap that he had earlier hung around his neck. The train journey was uneventful, but the engine stopped five miles short of the city, unable to proceed any further. Marix looked around for some other means of transport and spied a local civilian on a bicycle. Quite what happened next is unclear. The official report states that Marix returned to Antwerp on a bicycle he borrowed from a peasant. Well, in the, the pilot's more personal account compiled after the war, he wrote, uh, with some difficulty, I commandeered a bicycle and pedaled off. Clearly, the borrowed bicycle never found its way back to its now disgruntled and bewildered owner. A bridge blocking the road into the city presented the next obstacle. Heavily protected with barbed wire, there was no way he could cycle across. But with the help of a sentry, Marix hung the bicycle on his back, clambered onto the outside rail of the bridge and carefully edged his way across. Now, cycling through the eerily deserted city to the Hotel Saint Antoine, which just 24 hours previously had been the bustling British headquarters, the exhausted pilot got some food and wine. Suitably refreshed, he continued his journey. In one of Antwerp's great squares, he found a group of Belgian soldiers with two cars. After explaining his predicament, two of them agreed to drive him out to the airfield. 
Since Lieutenant Commander Gray had returned to the airfield at 4.45 p.m., it became a question of just how long they could afford to wait for news of Marek's. From about 8.30 p.m., German artillery shells began to drop on the airfield, where Gray, Lieutenant Sippy and the mechanics, now joined by two lost Royal Marines, waited nervously as shells seriously damaged both Gray's and Sippy's aircraft. When Marek's and the two Belgian soldiers finally arrived at the airfield, it appeared completely deserted. The three men cautiously approached a darkened mansion at the edge of the airfield that had served as the officers' quarters. Inside, tension mounted as Gray and Sippy nervously watched their approach. And when the Belgians began talking Flemish, Sippy prepared to open fire at what he thought must be Germans. Just at the crucial moment, though, Marix spoke in English and averted disaster. It was clear now that it was time to go. Germans were reported in the woods bordering the airfield and already one of the mechanics had been shot at. At 11.30 p.m. on the 8th of October, Gray, Marix, Sippy and the rest piled into their transport and headed for the road west, the great tide of refugees slowing their progress to a crawl, but they eventually reached Ghent shortly after daybreak. By 5 p.m. that afternoon, they were in Ostend and reunited with their squadron. Lieutenant Commander Gray received immediate orders to proceed to England and report personally to the Admiralty on the success of the mission. The first German units moved in to occupy Antwerp at 1 p.m. on the 9th of October, the successful conclusion of the raid coming with just hours to spare. On the 10th of October, British newspapers began trumpeting the story of the great enterprise and fating the achievement of Lieutenant Reggie Marix and the RNAS in destroying a Zeppelin as it lay in its lair. By the end of the month, Marix was the proud recipient of the Distinguished Service Order. It had been a stunning achievement. But the Admiralty didn't stop there. Keen to strike again, it now had an even more important and symbolic target in sight. Friedrichshafen in southern Germany on the shores of Lake Constance, the home of Count Zeppelin's factory and the birthplace of his airships. Incredibly, the Admiralty chose a civilian to take on the dangerous and demanding role of planning the raid. That man was an extraordinary, self-confident, impetuous, self-made man called Noel Pemberton Billing. Aged 33, he had already led an adventurous and varied life. His biographer noted that his fascinations were fast aircraft, fast boats, fast cars and fast women. He got the motoring bug early and once got a job as a chauffeur before he'd ever sat behind a steering wheel. He'd seen service in the Boer War, acted on the stage, published a motoring newspaper, become an inventor, a yacht dealer, an extraordinary engineer, and more recently, an aircraft designer. It was the last of these that brought him to the attention of the Admiralty. That and his dogged determination. In 1913, for a wager, he'd learned to fly and qualified as a pilot in the space of just 24 hours. When Pemberton Billing set his mind to something, he usually achieved it. Having learned to fly, he turned his attention to aircraft design and opened a factory near Southampton, where he built his first aircraft, a flying boat he called the PB-1. By summer 1914, Pemberton Billing was working on a new aircraft known as the PB-7, but the authorities displayed little enthusiasm or confidence in it. Pemberton Billing, however, was not a man to doubt his own ability, and on the 31st of July 1914, he secured an appointment with Murray Souter at the Admiralty, hoping to persuade him to place an order for his PB-7 flying boat. Suter remained unconvinced of the aircraft's merits, 
But Pellington, Pemberton Billing left the office undaunted. He had learned that the Admiralty were more interested in land planes at that moment. He decided he would build one, a fast single-seater scout aircraft, which he designated the PB-9. Just four days later, with plans drawn up, he began work on the prototype. Just seven days after that, it made a successful test flight. The incredible speed of production, so typical of Pemberton Billy, earned it the nickname, the seven day bus. However, when it underwent uh, strict military trials, the test pilot became increasingly concerned about its airworthiness. Trying to make a point, an irritated Pemberton Billing took the controls, but managed to smash the undercarriage while still on the ground. From then on, Pemberton Billing had, in his own words, haunted the passages of the War Office and Admiralty, sometimes from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. I offered to design, to work, to build, to hand over to them all my facilities at Southampton, but never an offer was accepted during that terrible first month of bloody war. The next step is a little unclear, but it seems that Pemberton Billing's determination and enthusiasm impressed Souter, while episodes from his adventurous past confirmed a considerable ability to plan and carry out complex operations. In particular, his successful enterprise in 1913, when he sailed to Monte Carlo on a mission to recover a steam yacht for a Southampton boat dealer. His plan to recover the boat chartered but not paid for by a German officer required ingenuity, daring, bravado, and bluff to carry off, but was successful. Souter later described Pemberton Billing as a fine organizer and a capable man, and chose him to plan the raid on Friedrichshafen. As Pemberton Billing was a civilian, Souter obtained him a temporary commission as lieutenant in the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. A few days later, Souter also arranged a sub-lieutenant's commission for Frank Brock, a friend of Pemberton Billings and a director of the Brock Fireworks Company. On the 21st of October, the pair set off for Belfort in France, close to the border where, where, the, where France, Germany and Switzerland meet. Wearing civilian clothes and travelling in Pemberton Billings' white sports car, they arrived in Belfort three days later. Belfort lay just seven miles from Germany's Alsace border, and here Pemberton Billing contacted the French authorities to discuss use of an airship shed and landing field there. Despite their initial concerns, Pemberton Billing eventually won them over and gained permission to use Belfort as a base for the operation, along with one of its airship sheds. But there was a condition. The French insisted that the operation must take place in complete secrecy and be completed within 30 days. The clock was already ticking. With the arrangements made, Pemberton, Billing and Brock sped off to Switzerland. They passed through the border as commercial travellers and arrived in the town of Romanshorn on the southern shore of Lake Constance. Friedrichshafen lay eight miles away across the lake. Wasting no time, the pair befriended a local fisherman and persuaded him to take them over the lake after dark. That night, Pemberton Billing landed safely on the shores of the lake's north shore, just a short distance from Friedrichshafen. Brock returned to Romanshorn with the fisherman to ensure that he returned to pick up Pemberton Billing the following evening. He was now a British spy alone in Germany. He remained hidden for the rest of the night. Then in the morning, he walked into town. Owing to their great size, the various installations that formed the Zeppelin works were easily located, and he noted their positions on a map and made sketches. But he was beginning to attract attention. He was a very tall man who habitually wore a monocle, and to the average German probably looked like a typical Englishman. He, noted, 
<clears throat> with a noticeable increase in vigilance, he considered it time to disappear. He noticed an unoccupied, an unoccupied house, forced his way in and prepared to hide out until dark before returning to the rendezvous at the lake. Things remained quiet until dusk, but as he was preparing to leave, much to his horror, a car pulled up outside the house and three German officers got out. Leaving their driver in the car, the officers approached the house, at which point Pemberton Billing made a quick exit through a window, snatching up a weighty metal lime ornament as he passed the mantelpiece. With the officers now in the house, he slipped around behind the car and brought the lion crashing down on the head of the unfortunate driver. Dragging the now unconscious man clear, he jumped behind the wheel and sped off, the German officers dashing out just in time to see their car melting into the gloom. With no further mishaps and reunited with Brock, the two men finally got safely back to England on the 28th of October. It had been an interesting seven days. Having studied Pemberton Billings report, Souter gave the go-ahead. The raid was on, but with a deadline imposed by the French of the 23rd of November, there was no time to lose. While Pemberton Billing and Brock had been dashing around Europe, Souter assembled a team for the mission. He gave command to squadron commander Philip Shepard, an experienced flyer currently serving as an instructor at the Military and Naval Central Flying School. Souter then selected squadron commander Edward Briggs as Shepard's second in command. Briggs had arrived in France as part of the East Church Squadron and had been actively engaged in aircraft and armoured cars ever since. His engineering expertise marked him down for a place on the mission. Flight Commander John Babington, a pilot based on Dun at Dunkirk, joined the team, as did Flight Lieutenant Sidney Sippy, a second veteran of the original East Church Squadron, and one of the team to stay on in Antwerp until the last. Sippy was a very experienced flyer, having worked as a test pilot before the war. The final pilot, Flight Sub Lieutenant Roland Cannon, was to be the extra man in case any of the other pilots dropped out through injury or illness. Details of the mission remain secret at this stage, both selected merely instructed to hold themselves ready for special duties. The aircraft selected for the mission was the Avro 504. Developed in 1913 by Manchester-based A.V. Rowe and Company Limited, the Admiralty had taken delivery of one in September 1914, given the naval number 179. The Avro was normally a two-seater biplane and with a 36-foot wingspan could reach a maximum speed of 65 miles an hour. However, its endurance of three hours was not enough for the requirements of the raid. But by fitting an additional fuel tank in the forward cockpit, the aircraft seemed perfect for the task ahead. The Admiralty placed a contract for the deliv delivery of six more Avro 504s, the first three of these earmarked to join number 179 on the Friedrichshafen raid. Squadron Commander Briggs took responsibility for the airframes of the Avros, which were to be packed into crates before shipping to France. Flight Commander Babington focused on selecting the six most reliable engines he could find, along with spare parts. Together, they selected five riggers and five mechanics to assemble the aircraft and fit the engines. A young designer at AV Row named Roy Chadwick constructed a simple bomb dropping rig for the aircraft and joined the team bound for France. Chadwick later went on to design the iconic Avro Lancaster bomber of the Second World War. The date for departure from Southampton was set for the 10th of November, two weeks before the expiry of the French deadline. Briggs, Babington, Cannon, the 11 man engineering team, four aircraft in packing crates and a motor car, duly assembled at Southampton docks and boarded a freighter, the Manchester Importer, 
still without knowing their destination. Shepherd and Sippy traveled separately, driving by car to Belfort. Briggs, second in command, only received details of the mission when Pemberton Billing arrived on the quayside in his sports car shortly before the ship sailed. Pemberton Billing dashed aboard, handed Briggs various papers and a sack containing 500 gold sovereigns and a quantity of French banknotes, then departed again, choosing to cross to France on a faster ship. Once in France, he joined Brock, who had finalised the arrangements for a special train to transport the team to Belfort. There was some delay in unloading all the equipment at Le Havre, but by 11.30 p.m., everything was on board, including Pemberton Billings car, and the train departed. The train continued all the way to Belfort with just one stop where Pemberton Billing offloaded his car and drove off to complete arrangements. He was waiting for the train when it finally pulled into Belfort station at 9.30 a.m. on the 13th of November. Reluctant to compromise the secrecy of the mission by having the crates unloaded in daylight, Pemberton Billing had the train shunted to a disused railway siding until nightfall. Then, once darkness fell, the transfer of crates and men to the airfield by road began. They moved directly into the airship shed, everyone instructed on the grounds of secrecy not to leave its confines. The move was complete by 11.30 p.m. and as the men had rested all day, work began immediately on assembling the four aircraft. By 3.30 a.m. on the 14th of November, all were ready. There was, however, a problem. Shepard and Sippy, who travelled separately, had not arrived, and there was no news of them. After a frustrating journey blamed on engine troubles and roadblocks, although a Sippy family story also reports an unscheduled visit to Paris en route, they finally arrived at 10.30 a.m. 15th of November, two days after the main party. The weather had been fine for some days, offering perfect conditions for the raid, but in view of the exhausted condition of Shepherd and Sippy, it was decided not to make the attempt that day. After another uncomfortable night in the vast, drafty, dank, cold airship shed, the weather that greeted the men the next morning did not bode well. The wind began to blow a stiff breeze from the east, heralding an unwelcome drop in temperature to minus seven degrees Celsius. The weather continued to hinder the mission, while the pilots expressed concerns over the airship field, which they found rough and stony. Not a problem for airships, but potentially lethal for aeroplanes. They cleared the larger stones, and when a brief lull in the weather appeared on the 17th of November, Shepard decided to test his aircraft Avro number 179 on the cleared strip. Moments after he began to taxi, however, the left wheel buckled, forcing the collapse of the undercarriage, which caused the propeller to smash into the ground. It was not an auspicious start. Shepard was now, in fact, a very sick man. The weather and the hours spent in the cold, damp airship shed, sleeping on concrete floors, had taken its toll on him. Concerned for his health, Pemberton Billing broke his rule of secrecy and sent Shepard to a hotel in Belfort. Later that day, while the mechanics carried out repairs to number 179, the bad weather returned. Concerned about the effect that could have on the health of the other pilots on who the success of the mission depended, Pemberton Billing now moved them all to the hotel. The pilots then entered into a dreary routine. They reported to the airfield each morning between 7.30 and 8 a.m., where they remained until 12.30, at which point, if the weather failed to clear, they abandoned the attempt for the day. Return flying time to Friedrichshafen was estimated at three and three quarter hours. It would be considered too dark to affect a safe landing after 4 p.m. During this enforced delay, Squadron Commander Shepard's health deteriorated further. 
Concerned over his fitness to take part in so testing a mission, Pemberton, Billing and Briggs spoke to Shepard and he eventually agreed to stand down. His place in the roster taken by Cannon, the reserve pilot. With only three days of their permitted time left, the pilots arrived at the airfield as normal on the morning of Saturday, the 21st of November. But something was different. Although it was still extremely cold, the sky was clear and the wind was now blowing from the west, driving away the clouds over Germany. The raid was on. Pemberton Billing held a final briefing on the route, a round trip of about 250 miles that could not be on a direct path. The meanderings of the Swiss border placed a portion of this neutral territory in their path. Instead, a diversion through the turbulent air above the mountains of the Black Forest was necessary in order to prevent a diplomatic incident. The pilots knew the layout of the Zeppelin works. Pemberton Billings' spying mission had provided maps and sketches. They also carried maps of Germany, but not of France. The French authorities insisted on this. Should enemy bullets or mechanical failure bring the pilots down in Germany, they did not want Belfort incriminated in the raid for fear of reprisals. At 9.30 a.m., mechanics wheeled the four aircraft from the airship shed, lining them up at the western end of the airfield. Having run their engines to warm them, at 9.45 a.m., Squadron Commander Briggs took to the air and began climbing to three and a half thousand feet above the airfield, followed at five minute intervals by Babington, then Sippy. But Cannon, in the seemingly jinxed number 179, failed to get off the ground due to engine problems. He made a second attempt, but that resulted in a broken tail skid. The other three aircraft, all having reached three and a half thousand feet as planned, were now disappearing into the distance, each carrying their precious cargo of four 20 pound bombs. Cannon could only watch as they gradually disappeared from view. The Zeppelin works at Friedrichshafen were a hive of activity that morning. The facility had been working at full capacity for some time to meet an order for 10 M-class Zeppelins. Two shifts, each of 500 men, kept production moving at a fast pace. Construction took place in two large buildings known as the Ring Shed and the Factory Shed. In November 1914, as the raiders took to the air, the latest Zeppelin L7 was nearing completion in the Ring Shed. Built as a typical Zeppelin of the M-Class, the L7 was 518 feet long with a diameter of 48 and a half feet. The day before the raid, workers at the factory had commenced filling her with almost 800,000 cubic feet of hydrogen lifting gas prior to her first trial flight. The timing of the raid was perfect. Zeppelin L7 was a bomb primed for detonation. In the absence of any French maps, the three pilots initially set course towards Basel on the Rhine, which offered a clear visible landmark. A little to the south of Pemberton Billings prescribed route. With any luck, they hoped to find it again on the return flight and steer a course from there back to Belfort. The pilots managed to keep in fairly close company on this first leg of the journey with Briggs ahead and flying further to the south than the others. They reached the Rhine at about 10.20 a.m. As they passed Lorach, they, <coughs> about six miles northeast of Basel, observers spotted the aircraft heading east and immediately telephoned this information to Friedrichshafen. Despite the wind, clouds still clung to the Rhine Valley, forcing the pilots to climb to heights between four and 5,000 feet as Babington gradually fell behind, his engine struggling to maintain full power. At about 11 a.m., although it appears Briggs made a deliberate attempt to avoid flying over the neutral Swiss enclave of Schaffhausen, which juts across the Rhine into Germany, 
it seems likely he failed. Either way, neither Sippy nor Babington tried a similar adjustment and continued to follow the Rhine. Over Schaffhausen, Sippy finally lost sight of Briggs and noted that Babington was trailing about two miles behind. Then at 11.30 a.m., Babington at the rear lost sight of Sippy in cloud. All three pilots were now alone. Over Lake Constance, the wind had dispersed the clouds to reveal a bright and crisp autumn morning. At the Zeppelin works, the staff were at lunch when a telephone call from Constance, about 17 miles west of Friedrichshafen, confirmed the earlier sighting of unidentified aircraft. The troops guarding the works were put on alert and the crews of the three anti-aircraft guns and two machine guns defending the factory manned their weapons. The designated commander of Zeppelin L7, Werner Peterson, was in Friedrichshafen to take command of his new ship once it had passed its trials. He received a phone call at his hotel advising him of the news and immediately set out for the Zeppelin works. As he made his way through the town, the guns burst into action, opening a heavy fire on a descending aircraft. Looking towards the sky, Peterson saw Briggs Avro 504. It was heading towards the Zeppelin buildings from the lake at an altitude of several hundred meters. As the shell burst from the anti-aircraft guns lay very close to him. Meanwhile, the plane flew over me and dropped the first bomb, which was easily visible while falling. It hit a house about 60 meters from me and exploded partly destroying the upper story. The explosion killed Heinrich Wiedmann, a 21-year-old tailor's assistant, as he was on his way back to work. He died instantly from a bomb fragment that penetrated his heart. Two people in the house were injured. The wife of a train driver, Frau Deschler, received serious injuries to her head and shoulder, while the blast tore away the lower left arm of Fraulein Mag. Peterson continued to watch helplessly as Briggs descended to about 450 feet and released two more bombs as he closed on the great sheds. The German officer continued his report. The pilot skillfully dropped the bomb, which however merely landed on the field. Then another, which was accurately aimed and hit between the two sheds causing minor damage to the shores, to the doors of the new shed. But then Briggs' luck ran out. The ferocious fuselage he had flown into, into had damaged his aircraft, and with fuel now gushing from his petrol tank, he had no choice but to glide down in a tight turn and make an emergency landing right in front of the Zeppelin sheds. As Briggs sat in his cockpit, dazed by a shrapnel wound above his right ear, a soldier fired at him, but missed. Troops and workmen then rushed at the aeroplane. Briggs groggily fired one revolver shot at them, which also missed, then grasping hands dragged him from the cockpit. While bent forward, he received a heavy blow on the top of his head from a rifle butt. Two soldiers then led him away while a hostile crowd of factory workers closed in. A German officer regained order by threatening to shoot anyone in the crowd who laid their hands on the British airmen. While Briggs had been preparing to start his attack, Sippy, having disappeared from Babington's view, had descended down to the extreme west end of Lake Constance. To lessen the chance of detection, he chose to skim daringly over the surface of the lake, estimating his height at just 10 feet and continued at low altitude past the town of Constance. Turning towards the North Shore, he followed that until about five miles from Friedrichshafen when he commenced his climb to 1200 feet. To the north of the town, he observed shrapnel shells bursting. He knew that Briggs had reached the target. When he reached a point about half a mile from Friedrichshafen, Sippy began a dive down to 700 feet, 
noting the time at 11.55 a.m. and flew inland over the hydrogen works. Here he encountered a very heavy defensive fire and observed a large number of men near the Zeppelin sheds, the point where Briggs had landed. He dropped his first bomb in an attempt to put the gunners off their aim. Then, as he approached the sheds, he released two more. His fourth and last bomb failed to drop. On the ground, Peterson continued to watch with a professional eye. Sippy, he reported, uh, dived low in the heavy fire and above the downed aircraft released two bombs which exploded in the field. And then he flew very fast above the sheds and dropped a bomb which caused damage to the workshops and damaged a window of the shed in which L7 lay. 20 meters farther and the inflated ship would have been destroyed. Unaware of how close he had come to destroying L7, Sippy's main concern now was the fourth bomb, still caught up in the frame. As he arrived back at the lake, he attempted to release it over an, an old floating Zeppelin shed, but it remained stuck firm. Two machine guns then opened fire on him, and as there was nothing more he could do, Sippy dived down to the surface of the lake and made good his escape. Babington, the last to arrive over Lake Constance, maintained his height. He was flying at about 4,000 feet when he sighted the Zeppelin works and noticed shrapnel bursts over them. Later, when level with the floating Zeppelin shed, he saw Sippy escaping low over the lake. Then, as he turned to make his attack, the gunners on the ground opened up. Fortunately, the shells burst well below him. Babington had already decided to make his attack with the sun directly behind him to hinder those trying to shoot him down. These final moments seemed to take an age, but finally he felt he was in the right position to commence his attack and began what he described as a very steep descent in a slight curve over the sheds. He was now the sole target for all the anti-aircraft guns, machine guns and rifles on the ground but the speed of his dive made it difficult for them to find their target. At 950 feet, Babington released two 20 pound bombs. About five seconds later, with adrenaline now pumping through his body as his Avro nearly vertical plummeted towards the ground, Babington released the last two bombs, feeling the blast from the explosion as he strained to bring the nose of his aircraft up. Even though fighting to regain control of his plane, Babington managed to catch a glimpse behind and thought he saw a hole in the roof of one of the sheds and smoke. He was convinced that at least one bomb had struck home. But the lack of intense flames of burning hydrogen was surprising. Back over the lake again, Babington began to climb back up to 4,000 feet, dil diligently recording that firing ceased at 12.08 p.m. and headed back towards the Rhine Valley. An hour later, he spotted Basel again and set a course that he hoped would take him to Belfort. Sydney Sippy, already ahead of Babington and flying a faster aeroplane, landed back at Belfort at 1.50 p.m. after a fine piece of navigation that had seen him fly 236 miles over enemy territory and another 14 unmapped miles over France. His aircraft bore a number of bullet holes, but it had survived the ordeal and brought Sippy safely back again. He reported all he had seen to Pemberton Billing, but could offer no information on Briggs or Babington. At 3.30 p.m., still with no sign of either missing pilot, the team at Belfort began to fear the worst. Then the telephone rang and broke the melancholy mood. Babington was safe. He lost his way, became disorientated and not knowing where he was, landed in a field about 40 miles west of Belfort. A farmer approached him, but Babington struggled to make himself understood. Only when the farmer struck the ground with his pitchfork and proudly proclaimed La France, did Babington finally realise he was safe. 
However, Pemberton Billing still had no news of Squadron Commander Briggs. On the following morning, a delegation of high-ranking French officers arrived at Belfort. Within the dark and drafty airship shed, a formal presentation took place to bestow both Sippy and Babington with the cross of the Légion d'Honneur, France's highest award. A message from General Joffre, Commander-in-Chief of the French Army, confirmed that Briggs would also receive the award at the first opportunity. Later that day, with much relief, Pemberton Billing received news from London. The Admiralty had learned through Dutch sources that Briggs was alive but wounded and under care in a German hospital. The same telegram also ordered Pemberton Billing to pack up all aircraft and equipment and return as soon as possible to London. Before departure, Pemberton Billing explored all possible sources of information and concluded that damage caused by the raid included the complete destruction of one Zeppelin, serious damage to the larger shed and a demolition of the hydrogen producing plant. However, a German account published following the raid stated that the latest Zeppelin L7 had not been touched in the attack and was ready for service. It was the German account that was true. In spite of the Allies' insistence, Zeppelin L7 was undamaged. And on the 23rd of November, two days after the raid, she emerged from the shed and undertook her delayed trial flight over Lake Constance. With Werner Peterson now in command, she received her commission the following day and departed for Leipzig, having been just 20 meters from disaster three days earlier. And in reality, the damage to the Zeppelin factory had been light and quickly repaired. While there was actually admiration for the intrepidity of the British pilots on the part of many German officers present, there were also great concerns. Werner Peterson wrote that when they searched Briggs and his aeroplane, they found accurate maps and sketches of the Zeppelin works, those prepared by Pemberton Billing, which convinced all concerned that espionage had been involved. The German authorities believed it an inside job and ordered the removal of all directors of the Zeppelin company for questioning and a close inspection of their papers. Needless to say, the investigation found nothing amiss. On the morning of the 23rd of November, the day the French deadline expired, Belfort buzzed with activity as the British party prepared for their departure. Shepherd and Babington left in one car, Pemberton Billing, Sippy and Cannon in another, while the riggers and fitters boarded the train that had brought them there 10 days earlier. Pemberton Billing, whose driving and love of speed often raised eyebrows, managed to lose control of his car on an icy road and wrapped it around a tree. Sippy and Cannon were fine, while Pemberton Billing suffered minor injuries. The accident forced the three to rejoin the group on the train for the uneventful final leg of their journey. They were all back on English soil on the 26th of November when Pemberton Billing headed direct to London to make his report to the Admiralty. By then, Winston Churchill had already stood in Parliament and advised the House of the RNS pilots' actions to great acclaim. He concluded, this flight of 250 miles, which penetrated 150 miles into Germany across mountainous country in difficult weather conditions, constitutes with the attack a fine feat of arms. The British press gave wide coverage to the daring raid and continued to repeat the story of a Zeppelin destroyed in the attack. French newspapers applauded the raid too, one journal describing it as one of the most magnificent feats of arms performed during the war. The British government announced the award of the Distinguished Service Order to Briggs, Babington and Sippy on the 1st of January 1915. But Pemberton Billing was not officially recognised. However, Souter did not forget his important contribution 
and later wrote, I place it on record that the Naval Air Service owes much to Noel Pemberton Billing for his valuable help in his intelligence work before the attack and for the attention he gave to every detail of transport work to enable the pilots to achieve their success. There now just remained the sensitive issue of whether the British pilots had crossed neutral Swiss territory. An official communication from the Swiss Federal Council asked the British government's view of the reported incident. After some deliberation, the Foreign Office issued a carefully worded response. In view of the proofs advanced by the Federal Council, the British government gives the assurance that the aviators acted contrary to its intentions and expresses its deepest regret. Reports suggest that Churchill's private and rather less diplomatic response was, oh, tell the Swiss to go and milk their cows. Back at the Admiralty, as the Friedrichshafen raid reached its conclusion, wheels were already set in motion for the next raid, the target this time, the large Zeppelin shed at Nordholz near Cuxhaven. The raid carried out by seaplanes took place on Christmas Day 1914, but low ground mist prevented any of the aircraft locating the target. These raids, instigated by Churchill on Cologne, Dusseldorf, Friedrichshafen and Nordholz, resulted in the destruction of just one Zeppelin. He had hoped that this aggressive policy would put the Germans on the back foot and obstruct the anticipated Zeppelin offensive against Britain. Yet despite the audacity of these operations and the bravery of the pilots, in fact, the result was the complete opposite. The impact of the raids forcing Germany to commence, to commence bombing Britain earlier than would otherwise have been the case. Unknown in Britain at the time, Kaiser Wilhelm had blocked all attempts by the military to commence the aerial bombing of Britain. Wilhelm, like so many at the beginning of the war, believed it would soon all be over. He was cousin to the reigning British monarch, George V, and a grandson of the late Queen Victoria. He had no wish to be responsible for bombing Britain and London in particular, with its many important historic buildings and monuments and the home of the royal family. No one wants to bomb their granny's house. So Wilhelm had rejected all proposals to commence a bombing campaign against Britain in 1914. But the Zeppelin base raids changed things. Now the military brought extra pressure to bear. If the British kept attacking the airship fleet on the ground, they argued, the pride of Germany would in time be destroyed without ever striking a blow for the fatherland. Finally and reluctantly, 15 days after the failed raid on Nordholz Cuxhaven, Kaiser Wilhelm gave his approval. The first blitz on Britain was about to begin. Over the next 41 months, German aircraft, airships and aeroplanes bombed Britain on 101 occasions, dropping 270 tonnes of bombs, inflicting material damage estimated at the time at 2.9 million pounds and causing 4,830 casualties, of which 1,414 were killed. The face of war had changed forever. Thank you all for listening to me this evening. Thank you. Ian, that was absolutely tremendous. Um, that was very entertaining, very informative, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, you. if you would care to show your appreciation in the usual way, I think you all know the routine now. If you enjoyed it, just uh, raise your hands on the on the um, bottom of the screen as a silent uh, round of applause <laughs> for, for Ian. And I can confirm Ian. That I can hear it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> There's hundreds of, hundreds of hands going up as a silent um, as a silent uh, round of applause. It, it's Q and A time, and I know we've got a couple of questions already that came in du during the course of uh, course of your your, your um, presentation there. Okay. Um, so um, Steve Mason's not got a camera, so has asked me to ask on his behalf. 
um, if the German press reported any of the raids, including Cologne, and if so, how was this reported? And that's from Steve Mason. I think, um, yeah, generally the, the raids are reported, um, but because they didn't really achieve, I mean, the, obviously the raids like Cologne didn't achieve very much, you know, tried to bomb the railway station. It was definitely negligible there. Um, they did report the raids, but I don't think they really gave a very true picture to the German people, as with all sides in, in war, you know, propaganda is everything. No one wants to admit they've lost too much. No one, no one wants to admit casualties. So I think that the, the, the loss of, of Zeppelin Z9 was, was generally played down a little bit. It was sort of you know, a minor news story. It certainly was not given headline coverage um, as it was, was in Britain. Um, the, just a general policy within, within all nations at this time, just to, to keep, keep a lid on everything. You know, in Britain, when people are not talking about not giving details of the raids, um, a similar situation in Germany as well. It's, it's playing everything quiet, keeping it under control, really. That's Grant, thank, thanks for that. Um, John has joined us first, John Azar from uh, Canada. Hello, John, how are you? Uh, great, David. Thank you. Uh, Ian, that was terrific and fantastic <laughs> slides. A couple of questions. One, I was wondering what the reaction was in the aviation community in general, and particularly in the RFC. How do they see this kind of daring exploit in terms of what they well, might I think, be able to do? I think there's all, there was a tremendous jealousy between the RFC and, and the RNAS, and, and this was a 100% RNAS raid. Mm -hmm. So I think the RFC didn't really pay much too much attention to it because it was the RNAS that had done it. I think they obviously noted the ability to actually get into Germany to conduct the raid uh, and, and um, in case of Dusseldorf to, to be effective. But, but, you know, it was the RNAS and, and the RFC, you know, are not really, you know, sharing that, that joy, if you like. There's in 1914, they're, they're still out, you know, with, they're with the British Expeditionary Force they're conducting reconnaissance, they're doing artillery spotting, um, they're bombing railroad junctions at, at, at a bit, but, but not this sort of main, you know, headlining um, strategic bombing effort that the RNAS is going for at that particular moment in time. Yeah, it's particularly bold. Also, while you were speaking, I was following you on, uh, on the map, and I noticed that um, there's a museum in uh, Friedrichshafen now, have you been to it? And is this uh, raid covered in the museum, I wonder? There is, a, the, the Zeppelin Museum in Friedrichshafen is fantastic. And yes, I have been there. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a holy grail. You, if you like me, you've, you've got to go there. You have to go there. And Friedrichshafen it is a beautiful city as well. It's a beautiful city now. It was absolutely flattened in World War II, uh, completely bombed out of existence. Um, it's the city is the town has been rebuilt. It, it's a wonderful city to visit. The, the museum is fabulous. It, it covers it's the whole history from the early development right through to, to the, you know, the 1930s de development of the Zeppelins. Um, it doesn't, I don't, I don't think there was much, there was a, a there's a brief um, cabinet with a few bits about the Friedrichshafen raid, but it, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's minor. It's more a museum about the development of, of the Zeppelins as, as opposed, you know, it doesn't make a huge thing about their role in war. There is some, you know, small bits about it and that. But um, yeah, it's, it's about the development and, and, and the, the technical achievement of the Zeppelins. But it, it's a fantastic place. And of course, in, in, in the town, uh, there is an airfield where you can go on a flight on a modern Zeppelin, the oh. Ze called the Zeppelin NT, which is a, a much smaller airship, but a fantastic experience. And you can go on a, like a, a half hour's cruise over Lake Constance. And it's just a magical experience to be in an airship, which just it just seems so effortless and so quiet. It just takes off and it just you just float in the air. And it's an amazing experience. And if you ever get the chance to come over to Europe and visit Germany, you must go and, and visit the museum. And you also must go on a flight on a Zeppelin. Great. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Graham Nolan. Graham, do you want to just unmute yourself there? Um, I live near Skipton in North Yorkshire. And... In the local paper, the Craven Herald, dated 12th of February 1915, um, there's this very short article. I'll, I'll read it, if I may. Um, it is fresh in the memory of most people 
that on November 21st, a squadron of British airmen made a successful raid on the Zeppelin factory at Friedrichshafen. The public generally will now be pleased to learn that the three valiant flying men concerned, Squadron Commander Briggs, Flight Commander Babington, Flight Commander Sipper. Oh, yeah. We lost you again then. Oh, we lost you again, just mid, mid quarter. Let's just. You were just saying about the three airmen. Yes. Um, they were each awarded a solid gold cigarette case. Cigarette case, we got cigarette case. Yeah, uh, made by uh, Fatterini. Right, sorry, I, I'm so I'm ever so sorry, Graham. It's yeah. not working. I think you were going to say Fatterini there because that's a local. Um, yeah, I know that's a, 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 a yeah. one, fi one final attempt just to get, get through the. <laughs> okay, would that have been a one off or would it have been a number of tributes that were made? elsewhere um interestingly that it mentions that that uh, briggs is one of those who received it because briggs um was a prisoner of war and he actually escaped um from captivity but not until april 1917 so i'm not quite sure what that is but that that just sounds like it was just a one-off tribute I, i've not i must admit i've not heard that before and i've not seen one of those uh, one of those gifts so, um, I mean, there are, I believe there are some members of, of uh, Sydney Sippy's family watching t t tonight. So maybe they may be able to come in and tell us if, if there is one of those cigarette cases around. I, I didn't know. OK, thank you. Sorry about the sound. No, not your fault at all. Thanks, thanks Graham, for that contribution. And, and if uh, anybody's got the answer to, to, to that question, please do uh, pop something into Q&A and I'll, I'll uh, grab hold of you and get you onto the, uh, onto the Zoom. Um, so, who's next? Um, Alan Atkinson. Alan, um, I think you're... Yes, go for it. Evening, Ian. Um, thank you very much for all this. It's been a very interesting talk. I've got to confess it's not a not an area in which I've had much interest before, and I, I was quite surprised to find how early in the war was the first um, aerial bombing. Yep. Very, very quick question, really. Did, uh, did our aviators survive the war? Well, all three of them, the, yep. the, the ones I mentioned, yes, yes, they did. Um, yes, they all, they all, all, all uh, lived quite long lives, I believe. Good, good. Um, yeah, um, yes, they, they carried on serving throughout the, throughout the war. As I said, Briggs was a prisoner of war until 1917, but he came back and, and rejoined the services uh, when he returned. He, he, he got out through, he jumped off a train in Germany and um, he managed to get through, through to Holland and, and yep. was repatriated from Holland. Um, so yes, they did. All, all three okay. of them did, did did see through the war. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's really all I want. Pleasure. Th thanks, Alan. Thanks for that. Um, okay. Um, we're um, rapidly going through the questions here. So if anybody has got any more questions to ask, just pop them into the Q and A button on Zoom. I'll have a quick look on Facebook just to see if I can pick up any questions from there. But in the meantime, Sarah, um, mute yourself there. Hello, thank you for a fabulous talk. Um, my question is going to be, what was more terrifying in the public's mind, a Zeppelin or this newfangled aeroplane thing that was coming to the fore? I think, I think actually, I would say the Zeppelin. It's, you could understand an aeroplane, but a, a Zeppelin was, was actually like a monster. This was, a, a, these, these uh, airships are huge. Later in the war, they're, they're, they're 200 meters long. Um, you can hear them coming, even though they're, they're high, they've got this sort of engine noise you can hear. And, and, they, and they appear to be moving slowly. They're doing maybe 60 miles an hour, but if they're two miles up in the sky, they appear to be going very, very slowly. So it's, it's a very ominous presence. You can hear the droning of the engines. You can see this thing moving slowly across, and then you can see if the searchlights find it, they illuminate it, and suddenly you've got this object that's shining in the sky. And they only attacked at night, so and they only attacked on the darkest period of the moon each month. So there, this, it's a it's a dark sky, and suddenly you've got this shining silver object in there, and and people were, were fascinated and and scared in equal measures. 
people actually felt cheated if they hadn't seen the Zeppelin, but they were frightened by them as well. But the, the fact is that because of the Zeppelin, they, they only ever managed to get over one at a time. You'd only tend to get one Zeppelin over a town one at a time. You, you didn't get fleets of them. So if the Zeppelin wasn't dropping bombs on you, it became a fascinating thing to go outside and watch. The authorities hated this because it means you got in the way of the, the emergency services and any shrapnel falling from anti-aircraft guns, you're at risk of, of injury from that. They wanted you to stay indoors, but people were desperate to go out and see them, yet they were frightened of them, but they were exciting. It was like watching a UFO. You know, if a UFO mm -hmm. came over now, we'd all go out and see it and the death ray might, might, might wipe <laughs> us out. But, it, but it's, it's, it's that same sort of image. And, and I don't think that the aeroplanes, when the bombs came later on in the First World War in 1970, I don't think they ever had that same fear. Um, they're smaller, they're harder to see. Um, and when they came, at, uh, the first aeroplane raids were in daylight and that was horrific. But after about the first six weeks, they switched to night bombing. So that you've then got bombers coming over individually. It's, they're, they're in, comparatively, they're much, much smaller than a Zeppelin. You can't really see them. You don't know what they're doing. Uh, so it's, it doesn't have the same fear factor as, as a Zeppelin. I'm a Zeppelin man. Uh, they, would, they, would, they, would be, they would be the ones. Thank you. Thank you. Th thanks, Sarah, for that. OK, um, let, let's just um, go to Nick now. Um, we've got... Um, We've got Nick, and we've I've all I might be pseudonym, but I've got uh, somebody else, but I can't grab um, Sydney Sipi's granddaughter. Ah, um, yes. Uh, who um, goes by a pseudonym, I think, but unfortunately <laughs> can't can't, uh, can't grab um, can't grab her onto the Zoom. But Nick, go on, go for it. Uh, well, I was just going to say that. Um, uh, uh, my my sister and I aren't aware of, of, of uh, Sydney uh, receiving or still having <laughs> uh, any uh, uh, cigarette case, but uh, it's, it's just just explain, just explain. Nick uh, has put his question in, and he's the uh, grandson of Sippy. Yes, that's right. Oh, good evening. <laughs> Hello. Yes, and uh, we, uh, I enjoyed uh, Ian's. Um, uh, presentation today and uh, he did a very good one a few years ago um, on a ship in, uh, a boat in um, uh, on the Thames in London didn't he? H HMS president yes that's right that was very good so uh, again it's it even more detail this time but it's very very interesting so, uh, but there is no knowledge of this cigarette case is that what you're saying <laughs> yeah. but, <Pity. laughs> It's a, it's a shame because it's probably very valuable. <laughs> yes, it would be. <laughs> thanks for that, Nick. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us and, and thanks for uh, introducing yourself as the relative of one of these uh, bold flyers. So that, that's grand. Um, what, what one interesting thing, uh, uh, Ian? Uh, I was just so um, uh, Sydney Sippy uh, landed his plane still with the uh, bomb. Uh, uh, the, the last bomb uh, in the aircraft, did he? It must have been a, like, a nervous landing for yes, him, I think. That's right. <laughs> Kept him focused. <laughs> he didn't want it to sort of fall off just as he was landing. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh -huh. You know, but what an amazing job he did, you know, pinpoint navigation throughout. Fantastic achievement. Yeah. yeah. Th thanks for that. Thanks, Nick. Right. OK, let's um, let's go to some some more questions. Um, I've got a, just to just just to um, go into Facebook. Um, we've got a, a, a couple of uh, some questions here. So Mark Smith in, from Facebook has asked: Did the quality of weapons improve very quickly as we started to bomb Germany? Yes, I mean, obviously, where we are now in November nineteen four, well, October and November nineteen fourteen, we're talking about there are no bomber aircraft, and these are just you know. Any aircraft they've got available, they're fitting a rig to them that can hold bombs, and away they go. Very, very quickly, you know, you've got a rapid development of, of aviation, new types of aircraft coming on board, um, specialised aircraft coming on board. So yeah, you've got a, you know the whole you know rapid development 
on, on both sides, there's a rapid development of Zeppelin types. The Zeppelins in, improve tremendously um, during the, the, the four years of the war. Um, the, the aircraft, the British aircraft, the German aircraft, you know, it's, it's an arms race. Everyone's trying to outdo the next person to, to do the job more efficiently. You know, we're, we're, we're only in these raids, we're, we're one up from dropping a bomb over the side of the aeroplane. You know, at least they, they've got a frame, but, it, but it's new. It's brand new. Um, the, the, the Avro 504s in, in the Friedrichshafen raid, I, I'm not aware that, they, that any of the pilots had a chance to fly them before the raid because they weren't allowed out of the shed other than number 179, which, which actually broke its undercarriage. The others never came out. There were new aircraft ordered for the raid. That, so that, I don't know if they'd ever flown them. That ties nicely into another question that I've got also on Facebook from Martin Allen. Um, uh, Ian, so, and, and Martin's question was, was there no target practice before the way, raid or was it simply chaotic, risky attacks? Um, in, in this particular instance, absolutely no practice beforehand. Um, you know, a lot of these guys had been uh, in, in France uh, and they, they've been doing some bombing of, uh, I mean, certainly Sydney Sippy had definitely done a bit of bombing of railroad junctions uh, behind the German front line in, in, in October 1914. Um, as for the others, not so sure whether they have. I don't think, well, Shepard didn't fly it, fly it anyway, but he'd come straight from, uh, from, from the, the Central Flying School. So he would have, he may have done some practice bomb dropping, but not in anger. Um, but the planes, as I said, the Avros here, literally they went, they went up to Manchester. They went to AV Row and Company. Um, they checked them out. They packed them into crates there. They came in crates in like a uh, do-it-yourself kit. They were in, in boxes. Apparently, Pemberton Billing hit on the idea of painting Russian Cyrillic symbols all over the cases to put people off the scent. So they looked like they were importing some I don't know, caviar or something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, literally, they came down um, by train from Manchester to Southampton. Those, came, those crates went on the ship, and the ship they went on a train, and the train they went into the airship shed, and they didn't come out and fly until the raid. So those guys hadn't flown those aeroplanes. They didn't know what the engines were like. They, they, they were not new engines. They, they had they'd picked engines that were already out and running. Um, the job was just to try and do a few tests on engines, and, and hopefully they'd pick the, the, the right ones. So it was a, you know, it was a, it was a suck it and see operation, you know. There, there was no precedent. It really, it really is the birth of strategic bombing going on here. There were no rules. They were making up the rules as, sure. as, as they went along. That's great. Okay, just a, a couple more things from Facebook, which I've just picked out. Um, Marcus Poulin um, has uh, made uh, two comments. First of all, Marcus has said that this was the best webinar I ever attended. So yeah, thanks for thank that, you. Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> And also Marcus then follows it with a, a question saying, was Fred Friedrichshaven named after Frederick the Great? I don't know. I think there's probably every likelihood it might have been, but yeah. I don't know. Good, good question. We've stumped Ian on that one. Yeah, so, I, I miss it. Hands up. I don't know. <laughs> good stuff. Right. That's that, that's what I'm so let me just uh, go back to the um to the to the questions here. Trevor, Trevor Adams, do you want to just uh, unmute yourself there? I agree. Ian, thank you very much indeed for a super talk. Um, I said, this Belfour thing was something I knew very little about. Uh, That's really great. I've been to the Zeppelin Museum. Uh, it's I've fantastic, seen Zeppelin isn't it? In the sky. And my yeah. wife refused point blank to consider going on. Oh, such a I want pity. to ask you about, about Nordholz, because I've looked a lot at the Nordholz raid because of Erskine Childers' involvement. I was oh, tracking right. Erskine Childers. Yep. What's 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 your view of it? I'll, I'll come back with another comment in a moment. But what's your view of it? I think it it was a a brilliant idea. It was it was conceived really well. It was planned really well, but it was just completely defeated defeated by the weather. Mm. Um, it, I guess uh, making an attack on the North German coast, fog and mist is always going to be an issue, particularly in winter. And we're talking about Christmas Day, nineteen fourteen here, um, and. And I think th there were enough aircraft on that raid that if the weather had been clear, there's no question they would have found the sheds and, and they would have bombed it. 
um, but they were just absolutely 100% defeated by the weather. They could not see. It was a, a, a mist that rose well above the Zeppelin sheds. They were completely covered. Um, and within a short, it was clear out at sea, but once they got within sight of the coast, yeah. everything was, it was just a blanket of grey. There was nothing. There was no identifying features for them whatsoever. And they all flew around doing the best they could, trying to, even trying to sort of listen for sounds, anything. But a couple of them dropped some bombs, hopefully, but they, you know, yeah. it didn't have any effect. And yeah, it, it would have been, I think it probably would have been the most successful of the raids. Uh, I think it was like seven seven aircraft got got actually got over land, but but couldn't find the target. I, I, I'm interested because looking at the uh, the German stuff when it was in this book, your German is doing really good, called Schiff am Himmel. Right. Um, from the German records, they're saying that the British record for the chappy thinks he dropped a bomb in Wilhelmshaven Harbour didn't. They're fairly sure he dropped it actually. Uh, on Nordholz uh, for various reasons, like with Wilhelmshaven having no anti-aircraft guns at that particular time. So according to the book and according to the Germans, they think well, the, the one British bomb that, that fell did actually fall somewhere near Nordholz. But, but obviously not on the shed, though, because... Oh, no, no, not in the shed. They're just somewhere in the... So they think there's a crater in the ground somewhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. And that would have been just one of the random bombs. Yeah. being dropped right by someone, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the, the British report, the British guy thought he was over Wilhelmshaven. <laughs> that shows you how bad it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Well, thanks, Trevor. Thanks for that. Gordon. Thank you, David. Ian, smashing presentation, totally <laughs> absorbing, enjoyed it enormously. Thank I you. think you answered my question previously with what happened to the captured pilot. Well, um, spent a, uh, quite a while in hospital, quite a bit of time in hospital. When he was mm. when he was fit, he, he went through a series of um, prisoner camps um, with various other um, captured pilots, and they decided that they. It was always keen to escape, but the opportunity didn't arrive. But they decided it, it was. He was in a carriage on a train being shifted camps in April 1917. And the, the carriage they were in was, was the last carriage on the train. And it pulled in, it stopped at a, a level crossing or something. And basically their carriage was stuck out in, in the end. And their guard was in the next section. So Briggs, it was Briggs' idea, apparently. He said, let's go. And there were 10 pilots in there. And they said, all right. <laughs> so they all jumped out of the carriage and they just spread. Uh, all ran in different directions. They were chased by civilians. Civilians were pursuing them and they got in, got into the woods and they hid in the woods and it's laid low during the day. Each night they came out and moved on and tried to work out where they were. Um, gradually got close to the Dutch border and then they found there was a line of guards every 60 paces with lanterns yeah. and they said, well, there's no way they could get through. Um, so they all they tried to work around it and went further down and Briggs and another guy uh, were confronted by an armed sentry who fired at them. They both split and disappeared and both individually got across the border and both got to the, the first uh, Venlo railway station in Holland yeah. and they both found each other in, in, in the refreshment room on the station and the two of them and they got a train and, and they eventually got back, to, got back to England. They didn't get interned in Holland then? No, no, they were released oh, and God. they came back, yeah. Right. So there's another, there's another talk in that, isn't there? Uh, just <laughs> yes. Briefly, um, would, a would a successful raid have had, a, have had any great impact on the war if they'd have done what they set out to do? I think if they had managed to destroy the two sheds at Friedrichshafen, it would have stopped Zeppelin production for a while. Right. Um, I mean, the later they moved production away from Friedrichshafen anyway. But the fact is the Zeppelins didn't change the war anyway. No. Um, Germany had, had thought, you know, because there'd been no sustained aerial bombing campaign ever in history before, nobody knew how a civilian population would react in a city coming under regular bombardment. 
And Germany certainly believed uh, before the war that if they could regularly bomb a city like London, the, the civilian population, its morale would be smashed and they would um, demand um, that the government sued for peace. But obviously that never happened because no, no one really knew. And you know, the Zeppelins were never able to, to cause enough damage. They were never able to get whole fleets of Zeppelin airships over as any individual city at any one time and, and devastate it. You know, um, they had terrible problems with, with actually the actual ability of the Zeppelins to get here. There were so many um, imponderables that stopped them. The weather was a major problem for them. You know, fighting against headwinds, you know, you couldn't do it. Fog, you couldn't see what you were bombing. Um, Anti-aircraft defences, blackouts, all these things stopped them achieving what they wanted to achieve. But before the war, no one had known about how that was going to be. They, they did, however, uh, alter the complexion of Leeds in September 1916. They bombed the hell out of it, didn't they? Well, Leeds, no. Yeah. Le yes. The outs outskirts of Leeds had, had some, yeah. had some bomb, but, but not, not the city centre itself. Not the city centre, but no. on 25th and 26th of, of September 1916, they did come. Yeah. I've, got, I've actually got a book by Andrew Storkill. And it shows yeah. you where the bombed and what they did. They did quite a bit of damage. Yeah, all, all on the outskirts, though, isn't mm. it? Because yeah, well, once the anti, uh, there, there was a lot of searchlights around there, which actually um, persuaded the zeppelins away from the city centre. Uh, well, I mean, once the search, the Avro, which was at Eden. The Avro plant. In? I said they may yeah. have been looking for the Avro plant, which was situated at Yeadon, I think, at that well, point. Well, you know, you know, they never really bothered trying to look for individual things like that. It was, it was, it was beyond them, to be honest with you. Mm. They had enough trouble finding an entire city, <laughs> finding let, 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 let alone, let alone uh, an individual factory within it. You know, the number of times they, they reached London, they just randomly bombed. They never tried to find targets. It, it was beyond them at that stage. Um, the whole ability of you know aerial bombardment—it's it's absolute infancy here, and, and while they've got bombs, so, it's sorry, say It's just a terror attack, rail. Really. Yes, just, yes, ab uh, absolutely, yeah. Just right. I'll let you go. I'm, I'm holding the job up. Thanks, so Gordon. Thank, thank you. For your, for your thank thank, thank you. you, Gordon. Thanks. But last couple of questions. Last couple of questions. Um, John Doyle, who I can't get onto the Zoom. Um, so I'll read his question out. So it might be just a yes or no, uh, Ian, Mark, this one. Is there a list of ground crew from the raids available? A list of oh, oh, what, the, 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 what, the engine fitters and the riggers? I assume that's what John means. Yes. Um, I think there is, but I, I don't have it. I, haven't, I don't think I've got a copy of it. I, I think there probably is one somewhere, but... I might be wrong, actually. No worries, no worries. John's got me there. He'll talk to me about that. We're we're in, we're in contact anyway. We okay. We, I can follow that up with him. Sure enough, no worries. Uh, John's got John Casey. If you want to unmute yourself there, uh, Ian. Thanks for a great talk. Um, it's uh, a story you couldn't really make up, isn't it? Um, <laughs> the my my question was, did any Allied air raids later in the war managed to inflict damage on the Zeppelin fleet or, or their bases? Yeah, actually, in, in 1915, um, when you've got a, a strong concentration of the RNAS around Dunkirk, and they would work in conjunction with, with the home defences in Britain. So if there'd been um, a Zeppelin raid on Britain, the Admiralty would inform the, the, the RNAS pilots at, at Dunkirk to be on the lookout for returning Zeppelins. And, and so there was always patrols being, being flown out to try and intercept um, Zeppelins on their way back from Britain. And there were a number of um, airship sheds around Brussels. And on one particular occasion in June 1915, um, it was a night of a famous uh, incident where a pilot called um, Warmford uh, shot down a Zeppelin that, that was on its way back. But at the same time, two pilots from, from Dunkirk went out with the intention of trying to bomb the, the Zeppelin shed at Iver, um, which is, which is a, a suburb of, of Brussels, uh, because they believed the Zeppelin, Zeppelins would come and come back there. So if, if the pilots were going to intercept them, miss them, they thought the other pilots, if they would 
directed straight to a there, they might catch them there. And in fact, two pilots um, did manage to get to the uh, Avair airship shed. Um, it came under tremendous amount of anti-aircraft fire. It was quite a, quite a problem for them. But actually, they dropped their bombs and they destroyed the shed at Avair. And inside it was a Zeppelin LZ-38, which was quite symbolic because this was the 7th of June. And eight days earlier, that was the first Zeppelin that had bombed London. Uh, bombed London on the 31st of May, and it was destroyed it, uh, just a week later in, in a raid on, 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 that, on that airship shed. Um, the, 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 the airship sheds around Brussels, the, these are army airship sheds. There were two fleets. The army had its Zeppelin fleet and the navy had a Zeppelin fleet. So the, the naval fleet uh, sheds tend to be near the coast of Germany. Um, initially, the, the army... The army were more inland. The army didn't quite come to terms with how best use of Zeppelins um, and never they really um, adjust to it too well. Um, they initially in, in August 1914, they, they'd use a number in low level reconnaissance over the front and got shot down. Um, they just hadn't really worked it out. Um, once these sheds started being attacked around places like Avair and Brussels, they tended to move a little the sheds a bit further away. Um, so they weren't too close. And so uh, you, you, the, the naval sheds are basically beyond range, beyond range initially um, for those first couple of years of the war, they are beyond the range of, of, um, of attack. Um, there was another shed, uh, a couple of sheds at a place called Tondern, which um, we see now is part of Denmark, but at the time the German border um, went, went up that far. And because that was right on the coast, uh, there was a raid there uh, later in the war. There been a number of attempts, failed attempts, but they had a successful raid there later in the war using carrier-based aircraft to, to get them out there, to get them the distance and then launch them uh, from the sea uh, and, and, and carry out the raids there. And, and they had a very effective raid on, on Tondern later in the war as well. So, yeah, it was, it was something they did when they had the opportunity, but it, it, was, it needed a lot of, lot of planning and a lot of thought to do it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank, thanks, John, for that. Right, so the fin final um, um, thing here from me is, we've just had a, a message from Widget Finn, who yes. is not a pseudonym, but- Another uh, sippy. <laughs> but another sippy, it's the yeah. nickname uh, of uh, Sydney Sippy's um, granddaughter. Uh, and um, she said, pass on my uh, message to Ian, thank, thank Ian for giving publicity to this inspiring story in an excellent presentation. Um, her brother Nick responded about the cigarette case. Sydney lived until 1968 and was a much loved grandfather, but never talked about his exploits. So th thanks for that widget. And um, Ian, thank you very much. Um, I I've thoroughly enjoyed that. I know the questions have uh, been lively and have gone on <laughs> slightly longer than, than before. Uh, than, than, than expected. So it's been a, a wonderful talk. If everybody wants to raise their hands again in the usual manner as a final uh, recognition of Ian. Um, and um, let's um, look forward to next week's talk, uh, in, sorry, two, in two weeks' time, uh, which will be um, Mike Shield talking about the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. So if you're not registered for that, please do so. But that's all from us tonight. Ian, that has been absolutely tremendous. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. A very fast-paced, excellent presentation with plenty of images to keep us entertained. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for everybody watching. And um, with a bit of luck, um, I, I might well be back in the autumn to, to, to pick up these <laughs> again. But in, in, until then, have a good summer, everybody. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Mademoiselle from Armentier's Talking in our